now we can reason that we have an infinite number of such pencils passing through the point. That means apparently a fourth dimension. Now we have further an infinite number of such points. That means equally a fifth dimension. This is the standard argument of higher geometry for the fourth dimension. But it is after all, we can see now, essentially an intense statement of the reality of space. We have the pencil of lines passing through the point. That means three dimensions, and the reality of space. All this infinite number of radiating lines in the pencil produces only the one simple three-dimensional reality of space. They have not carried space beyond that simple reality. But now there are an infinite number of such pencils. We have infinitely multiplied that simple, three-dimensional reality of space. We have an infinite repetition or intensification of that reality of space. We have carried that reality into infinity. And now there are an infinite number of such points. With these an infinite number of times we yet further reaffirm that same infinite reality of space. The dimensions, in other words, produce an ever intensifying, an infinitely intensifying, reality of space. The so-called fourth and fifth dimensions mean the infinite reality of space itself. The fourth dimension, so much sought and so much desired, is reality. It is existence. The moving reality of space we see now how it is that matter or motion gives reality to space. For we have seen earlier that real space, not a vast stretch of non-existence, but real space, consists of the outspreading of creative power, power which can move, and does move. Now we see that it is in the motion of space at any or many of its points, first into lines, then into planes, then into three dimensions, that space has its final complete reality, and that if there is motion into yet further dimensions they simply make that moving reality of space yet more intensely real. They carry it into infinite certainty. To and how many elements do things happen? And we can answer now, in the light of greater, more absolute principle than any other which concerns the question, the query and how many elements do things happen? We can go far beyond the inadequate answer that they happen in three dimensions of space and in one of time. For they happen in far more than that. Einstein, and many others, have felt, as indeed we all, have felt, the fact that time is in some sense the outcome of space. But he did not realize that, with motion emerging from space and with time as the outcome of space through motion, we have an unbreakable triunity of space, motion and time. He did not realize that in saying that things happen or take place in three dimensions of space and one of time, and in emphasizing the fact that things happen instead of merely exist, because the physical world is a world of motion, we are admitting yet another element into the case, the element of motion. For we have seen that it is only through motion that time comes from space. Time is related to space only and wholly through motion. Time is not the direct fourth property of space. Unity, reality, as we have seen, is the fourth property of space. Time is rather the third element in that triunity which includes space and matter and time, all three triunities in one. If we should state the full fact we should say that things happen in three elements, not in two. Not in space and time. They happen in space and motion and time. Any lesser statement ignores the modern universe of motion. If we state the fullest fact, we should say that things in the physical universe happen not in four dimensions or elements, three of space and one of time. They happen in nine elements, three of space, height, length and breadth, and three of matter, energy, motion and phenomena, and three of time, future, present and past. Or if we put it most clearly we should say that things happen in three triunities, and in the three combined in one great triunity of space motion time. And if we put it most clearly of all we should say that things in the physical universe happen or take place or exist in three triunities, space, matter and time, and in one great triunity of those three combined, and that these three universal triunities, and their combined all-inclusive triunity, are the absolute image in every possible way of the supreme triunity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 3. The process of the universe. It is possible to see the process of the existence of the universe, in the light of God, for a yet further universal fact is waiting for us in regard to this process of the existence of space which reflects the existence of God. What we have just found to be true of triune space is true also of the other triunities which compose the universe. In space one dimension generates the second. The two dimensions generate the third. The three dimensions generate the reality, the existence, of space. This is the principle of the existence of space. Now this same principle is true of the other universal triunities. It is true of matter. Energy generates motion. That is evident. Energy and motion generate phenomena. That is equally clear. Energy, motion and phenomena combine generate or constitute the existence of matter. Matter becomes a complete existence in the union of those three elements. That is basic. 
The principle is equally true of the existence of time. The future produces or generates the present, the present comes wholly from the future. That is unmistakable. The future and the present produce the past, for out of the future comes the present, and out of the present comes the past. Of that there is no question. Future, present and past combined constitute or generate the complete existence of time. That is self-evident. The principle is true also of the triunity of human existence. His essential being or nature necessitates and produces the character, the mentality, the person, whom you know. Nature and person generate personality, for the nature, working through the person, or the person, working from his inner nature, produces the personality which touches others. And the three combined constitute complete human existence. The principle is true also of the triunity of space, matter, time. Space, the outspreading of the power of God, generates motion or matter. Space and motion combined produce time, which is the successiveness resulting as motion traverses space. Space, motion and time combined constitute the physical universe. We have then in this triunity the process of the existence of space, of matter, of time, of human life, and of the space-matter-time universe. The pattern is a process. It is the process of the universe. It is always the same. The first factor produces the second. The first and second generate the third. The three generate complete existence. This is the process of existence, whether of space, or of matter, or of time, or of the space-matter-time universe, or of human existence. The heart would be weak and the mind would be dull indeed which could not be stirred by such a vision, so vivid, so real, so universal, of the almighty process of the universe, in the image of its creator. For being versus becoming, in the light of the process of the universe systems of thought have from the beginning presented the question of being versus becoming. Is being or is becoming the secret of existence? Does this seem a somewhat abstract question? On the contrary, no broader division of the whole field of human thought can be found than the division which is described by being versus becoming. For generations ancient philosophy vibrated between the two. The march of Greek thought swung first to one side of the road, then to the other. Successive schools of philosophy were built about one point of view or the other. To a splendid series of thinkers the universe was a fixed fabric. It was permanent, and could be studied at leisure. It arose around one as a great framework of certainty. If one could but find the framework, the formula, of absolute being, one had the secret of all existence. To other strong thinkers the constant flux which they could see in all things, the changing positions of the stars, the turns of the tides, shifting winds, fire appearing and disappearing, the fluctuations of the soul, seemed the basic fact of the world, and they sought to find a formula to explain the universe in terms of change and motion. All things were always in every moment becoming what they were, and then immediately becoming something else. Becoming seemed, then, the secret of existence. Modern thought too has moved in an immense vibration, first toward the one and then toward the other position. For generations great philosophy has sought the ideal, the absolute, the fixed reality, the unalterable fabric of things, the changeless principle, so that we could know absolutely, and test all things by that absolute knowledge. Marvelous things the great classic masters of modern philosophy have done with the study of being. Science too has long sought the exact and unalterable. It has desired to be an instrument of vast precision, a sextant of certainty. Fixed facts, unbroken laws, absolute order, these, we have felt, are the pride of science. But now what shall we do? Philosophy and science have fallen in love with the other ideal again. We have crossed the road. The new science, the new physics and astrophysics, see flux as the very fact of the universe. Bewildering motion, nothing at rest, universal change, breakdown of atoms, free electrons, infinite variation, transition everywhere, universal becoming at immeasurable speeds in infinitesimal instants, these are what we see now in the universe. Development is the lens through which we gaze at all things to see them as becoming rather than already being. The theory of evolution is in all realms the most thoroughgoing theory of becoming as a universal formula that the world has ever known. Pragmatic philosophy tells us that truth is what becomes true to us in practice. Richlianism in religion says to you that truth is what becomes true to you in experience. Psychology, the study of how the soul acts and comes to be what we find it to be, takes the place of metaphysics, the study of what the soul unalterably and ideally is. Behaviorism pictures human life as continually coming into existence by its acts, a continuous becoming. Relativity finds the world one vast continuous flux, one universal becoming. The quantum theory depicts all things as existing by virtue of their incessant change. The modern world of thought has truly veered far over from fixed being to endless becoming. 
the whole swing of the world pendulum from being to becoming is expressed in the A. B. C. Of a genuine modern philosopher, 0F1, what is the precise meaning of the word exist? I find, first of all, that I pass from state to state. I change, then, without ceasing. The truth is that we change without ceasing, and the state itself is nothing but change. Philosophy, is the study of becoming in general. What shall we say, then? Is the process of existence being or becoming? Is it static or in constant flux? It is no easy choice which the ages put before us. But must we really choose between the two? Is it truly a necessary antithesis? Do being and becoming so exclude each other as the basic process of the universe? Shall we not look upon the universe in the light of its supreme, triune reality? Shall we not bring the riddle of being and becoming to the supreme solvent? If we do this, being and becoming as a process of the universe are seen not to exclude each other at all. Rather, the triune process of the universe, the universal process of existence, gathers together the principles of being and becoming in a great reconciliation. For the universal process of existence, in which the first factor produces the second, the first and second generate the third, and the three generate complete existence, is at once both being and becoming. It is, in the first place, the process of all existence, of all being, in God, in man, in space, in matter, in time, in space matter time, in everything. And at the same time it is in all things physical and spiritual a process of existence, a mode of being, which is in itself a constant becoming, a constant generation of second from first, of third from first and second, and of existence from the three. We see then the almighty reconciliation. For existence is both being and becoming, at once. The circle of being is within itself an incessant and never-ending becoming. The mighty process of existence does more than recognize both being and becoming. It is both being and becoming. It is static, for it is changeless being. It is endless flux, for it is constant becoming. It is both at once. It is a universal process of existence by which being is itself a constant becoming. In this triune universe, in the image of the triune creator, questions of being and becoming pass away. They melt before the sunrise. They merge into one supreme reality. This is the process of the universe. This is the universal process of existence, in absolute likeness of the three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 5. The being of God in the light of space. And now we rise yet higher. It is possible to see the being of God in the light of his universe. For the facts of space cast a revealing light upon that absolute existence of which space is but the pale reflection in the outer universe. It may be that the endless quest of mathematicians, and of other seekers after reality, the constant search for the fourth dimension, really gets its urgency from the deep, unconscious thirst of the soul for God. It may be no abstract curiosity, but an instinct that beyond these three dimensions lies the supreme reality. The vision of the being of God which breaks upon us when we see it in the light of space does not depend upon the facts of space. The facts of space simply call our first attention to that vision. Once seen, that being of God is self-evident. It cannot be forgotten. It becomes the reality at the heart of the universe. The divine triunity is not one plus one plus one. A crude objection has sometimes regarded it so, and pointed out that one plus one plus one equals three, not one. It sums up the one great objection to the Trinity. How can there be unity in one plus one plus one? A surprisingly large number of earnest and thoughtful people through the ages have been influenced by this objection. The vast majority of those who know God have not indeed been deeply moved by this objection, for they have felt instinctively that the life of God is an infinitely more vital thing than can be expressed in a crudely materialistic formula such as 1 plus 1 plus 1. But we can learn here from the intensive nature of space and its dimensions, as those dimensions combine to produce reality. Here then is the great answer, revealed by the nature of the unity of space, but self-evident in its own right, the Trinity, the divine triunity, is not 1 plus 1 plus 1. It is no more so than space is. Space is not height plus length plus breadth. That would be a childish conception of space. Space is too immaterial a thing for such a crudely materialistic formula. Add two dimensions together, and you do not get the area of a square. Add three dimensions together, and you do not get the contents, the total space of a cube. Space is not height plus length plus breadth. Everybody knows this. When you have three dimensions you never add them. That is meaningless. You multiply them. Space is height times length times breadth. You multiply the three dimensions, and you get the contents, the space, enclosed by the three dimensions. Height times length times breadth equals space. 
until you have the three dimensions, multiplied by each other, you have no space. You have only an imaginary line, or an imaginary plane. Space and reality come when you multiply the three dimensions. Height times length times breadth equals space and reality. So is the divine triunity. The trinity is not one plus one plus one. That is a childish conception of it. The trinity is an even more immaterial thing than space. If it is anything at all, it is life. It is the life of God. It is not like adding blocks of wood to each other. We have put away childish things. We are dealing with life, and divine life. The Trinity is not one plus one plus one. No such crudely material conception means anything in connection with it. The Trinity is one times one times one. That is life. One plus one plus one equals three. But one times one times one equals one. That is God. The three in one is brought to us in the God of the Bible and of the universe of space, matter, time and men is that kind of absolute unity in which each of the three is the whole. Each is not a part of God. Each is God. Each is the whole. We have seen such unity reflected, infinite, divine and spiritual though it is, in space, in matter, in time, in man, and in the space-matter-time universe. May we now see its mighty significance, not reflected, but in itself? In one plus one plus one each is a part of the whole. Each is one third of the whole. But in one times one times one each is the whole. For in such multiplication each unit multiplies and permeates every part of the whole. Each is most intensively the whole, and every part of the whole. The Trinity is not an inert division of God into three parts. It is not one plus one plus one. It is life. It is one times one times one. It is one times one times one equals one. It is multiplied, infinitely intensified reality. It is a living, active, intensive mode of being, in which each of the three interacts, penetrates, intensifies, lives in the other two, and each is the whole. One times one times one produces an intensive, multiplied unity, deeper, greater, more one, than simple unity could be. God is more deeply, infinitely one than he could ever be if he were not also three. O oh God, we adore thee. O oh God, thou art life. Forgive us if we have ever talked of thee as though thou wert material, or arithmetical, or anything less than infinite, immortal life, and have tried to measure thee, who art life, by our little formula, and doubted thee, because one stone plus one stone plus one stone makes three, not one, when thou art not stones but life. We adore thee, who art life, and art infinitely more one because thou art forever three. Chapter 10 The Secret of the Universe and the Problem of Change and Progress It is certain that the universe is one of continuous change. No observer can hesitate to admit what is so evident to all. Development never ceases its endless round of operations. It is equally certain that the universe is one of marvelous fixity. Forever changing, it is forever the same. Its constant change and its unending changelessness impress the mind with equal astonishment. Its universal world of change bewilders us. Its age-long changelessness mocks us or encourages us, as the case may be. Thinking has always vibrated between changelessness and change, between fixity and progress, as the law of the universe. Entire schools of thought have been based on one or the other view. The vibration from one to the other is a matter of emphasis. Everyone of candid mind must recognize both facts. For many centuries, until the last century, the great fact of change, of flux, as the ancients called it, has not had its fair share of emphasis. The world has been regarded too much as a fixed and frozen framework. This however is not quite as true of past centuries as we sometimes like to think. The 19th century did not invent the fact of change in the world. Great thinkers have always proclaimed the principle. Kant, Laplace and others have pointed out the law of continuous change in all things. It is a law which all must recognize. It is change from lower to higher, or from higher to lower, from simple to complex, or from complex to simple, in one endless interplay of things. We know of course that the emphasis of yet more modern days has been upon the law of change. A passion for the idea of progress has possessed many minds, not simply a desire for progress, but an eagerness to detect progress everywhere. Both progress and fixity are true. No one can rightly doubt either. All practical science is based upon the certainty of change and the equal certainty of changelessness. The contents of the test tube are a wild whirl of forces. And they will be at exactly a certain level, to a hundredth of an inch and with exactly such and such results, though all society be dissolved and kingdoms rise and fall. 
The star is an immeasurable gathering of power so vast, of movement so incredible in speed, of temperatures so unbelievable, and of upheavals so appalling, that the mind cannot grasp them. And the star will be at a certain place at a certain day and hour and instant, to a hair's breadth. 61 Both change and fixity are true. How shall we relate change and changelessness? How shall we combine development with the conservation of energy? What is the universal reconciliation of these two? What is the universal law of progress combined with fixity? Evolution not this universal law of progress Herbert Spencer said that evolution was this universal law. He applied it to all things. But it is not a universal law in the sense which we are giving to that term. We need not discuss it as a process in species in animal and plant life upon the earth. That is a question of scientific data and of technical discussion. But Spencer lifted it out of science into universal application. He wanted to make it a law of universal progress. But evolution, whatever its truth in species may be, is not a universal law, because it has no place in the universal things, the basic things, the fundamentals, of the universe. It is a conclusion from data which never can be complete or universal, which have to do only with species, and which do not apply to basic things. A universal law should lie deep in the being of space and matter and time, and evolutionary process has no place in these. No thinker would hold that space or motion or time or atoms or electrons were evolved by Darwinian or Spencerian formula. Nor can evolution apply to the universe as a totality. It cannot be a law of the universe as a whole. For dissipation of motion is the basis of evolution. And dissipation of motion from the universe as a whole is incompatible with the fact of the conservation of energy in the universe as a whole. Further, evolution does not mean universal progress. No one really holds it as such a law. Spencer did not. He said evolution and dissolution. Those were his two factors. Progress and the opposite. Many scientists today say that curve is the law of evolution as they know it in their own fields. Things progress upward, and downward again. Many scientists now teach devolution. That is progress downward. Men of science do not attempt to make evolution an invariable law of universal progress. It is not an invariable law of universal progress in human life. For no one would say that progress is universal in human life. Individuals, as we all know, do not all make progress. Nations rise, but other nations fall. Civilizations grow, but civilizations decay. Arts grow, and decline. There is steady increase in knowledge, but this is because knowledge is accumulation, not growth. Many nations have progressed, but not all. Vanished Aztecs, perished Incas, the degenerate remnants of ancient African civilizations, Asia, Africa and the Americas are strewn with immense evidences that progress is not universal in human life and society. Evolution then does not mean universal progress. And further, it is not a universal law and cannot be a universal law, a law of the universal being of things, because it does not allow for the universal fact of changelessness. That fact of changelessness has been recognized from the beginning of thought as of equal weight with the fact of change. Evolution as a rule of change or progress means complete discarding of the old and the outworn, a vanishing of types left behind, an advance which obliterates all those factors which have been outgrown. It is not a universal law in a universe in which changelessness is as marked as change. Above all, evolution is not a universal law, because it does not apply to God. He did not and does not evolve. Evolution cannot be a universal law, a law of the universe, when it does not apply at all to God. It cannot be universal to a theist. Spencer could not be a theist. It is not surprising that he felt himself obliged to eliminate God from the universe. It is not surprising on the other hand that others have made a grotesque attempt to apply evolution to God. Spencer's evolution, which could not apply to God, made the universe entirely different from its ground. But anything which is an absolutely universal law should be found also in God, who is the cause and ground of the universe. Evolution, then, is not always progress, it is sometimes downward. It does not apply to the universe as a totality. Evolution is by no means universal in human society. Evolution does not allow for the great fact of changelessness. Evolution does not apply to God. The law of changeless change, or the universal law of progress it is true however that there is change and growth. That fact, deep in everyone's experience of things about us, is what led many to accept Spencer's attempt to lift a process of species to the level of a universal law of progress. Is it necessary that we should discover a universal law of progress in the physical and spiritual world? I do not think that it is. The secret of progress for the soul is God. We can know Him. But the question remains. Is there a universal process of change and progress? 
one which applies to all things, one which is self-evident in the basic things of the universe, one which agrees with the fact of fixity in the universe, one which includes God? Yes. By going direct to the self-evident universal facts of the physical and spiritual world, we do find a universal law of progress, deep in the very being of all things. It is the law of progress from source to embodiment, and from embodiment to contact or influence, from nature to person and person to personality, from energy to motion and from motion to phenomena, from future to present and present to past, from space to matter and matter to time. It is a law of continuous change and progress in the very nature of being and the very process of existence. This is a universal law. It applies to all things. It includes all physical things, since they are of matter or motion and of time. It includes all personal or spiritual being. This is a law which we can apply to the universe as a totality. For its continuous process does not at all require dissipation of energy from the universe. This is a law applying to all human life, since it is the very, nature and process of human existence. This is a law of the absolutely basic things of the universe. It is self-evident, not a matter of the gathering of partial data. This is a law which includes God. It is the being of the triune God. It is the reflection and the working, in his universe, of the triune creative and ever-present God. This is a universal and self-evident law of progress and change which does not do away with the fixity of the universe, nor affect the eternal changelessness of God. Eternal progress from father to son, and from son to spirit, does not mean leaving behind fatherhood or sonship in that progress. Perpetual progress from nature to its embodiment in the person, and from person to its influence in personality, does not mean a cessation of nature or of person. Continuous development from energy to its embodiment in motion, and from motion to its contact or influence in phenomena, does not mean an abandonment of energy or of motion. Constant procession of future into present and of present into past does not mean that in that process all future and present thereby immediately cease to be. It is a law of continual change with all the elements continually and endlessly existent. It is changeless change, in which endless development is a characteristic of endless fixity, and endless fixity contains within itself endless change. This is the law of changeless change. It is change without dissipation of energy. It is a continuous change which discards no factors in its progress. It is self-evident. It does not depend upon partial data. It is the process of all the basic things of the universe. It is true of the whole universe of space, of matter and of time. It is true of man. It includes God. The law of progress practically applied this law of change and progress is one which can be applied consciously and practically to human conditions. It is a law which can be used to achieve definite ends. We cannot do so with the mere fact of change in the universe. It is not definite enough. We surely cannot so use evolution, since evolution is not always progress and does not always work upward, but often works downward, is not controllable, and does not always operate with men and nations. But we can apply the divine process. We can apply the universal law of progress which in human life moves from nature to person, and from person to personality. We can apply it to human conditions and social questions. This is Christianity's method of social progress. First change the nature. Change the nature by regeneration. Then by that regeneration change the person, his habits, speech, points of view, loves and hates, likes and dislikes. Then from the change in the nature, through the change in the person, change the personality, the self is related to others, the contact, the influence, the environment. This universal process of existence, this law of progress in the universe and in human existence, is the true method by which to achieve human progress. It is a universal, fundamental method. It is absolutely scientific. It is a method which can be used by anybody, a practical method. It is in harmony with God's way of working in the whole universe. It is accomplished by the simple fundamental method of letting the triune God and his triune process into a person's life. It is very easily done, by old or young, by the intellectual man or woman or by the African savage. The person accepts the Son, the embodiment of the Trinity. He becomes a follower of Jesus. He opens the door to him. The triune God comes in. The nature becomes that of a child of the Father. As many as received him, the Son, to them gave he the right to become children of God, who were born, not of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The person becomes united with the Son, in a redeemed, risen, Christ-like life. Then the Holy Spirit transforms, beautifies, glorifies the personality, and the influence upon others, and the whole environment. It is very simply done, as far as our part is concerned. It is the same in all lands and all cases. 
By that method the new and wonderful Christian society arose in the midst of a frightful Greco-Roman civilization. The humanizing influence of Greece and the organizing influence of Rome had done their best. Art had surrounded the people. There are no cities of such beauty today. A remarkable intellectual atmosphere was thrown around people. An extraordinary genius for government and order gathered the known world into the Roman organization. But society, amid all this humanizing and organizing environment, had grown steadily worse, and became one vast cesspool. The attempt to begin with environment had failed. Christianity came, and began in the divine order, the method of God's universe. It began with men's nature, and changed that. As an inevitable result, by the universal law, the person became changed. His habits, his likes, his speech, grew different, and became like his changed nature. Then his changed personality was felt. It influenced his home, his friends, his community, the Roman Empire. This was the influence of Christianity, the influence of changed persons, with a changed nature, who had become children of God. It was and is a simple, universal method, allowing for a wide variety of personal experience. In some people acceptance of the sun is emotional. In some it is demonstrative. In some it is quiet. In some it is matter of fact. In some it is simply following that person, Jesus, the sun. In some it is embracing him under the passionate need of forgiveness. In some it is the throwing away of old doubts and the open confession of him. In some it is the determination to live a life with his power in it. It is as broad as the human race. It is God's way and process. It is the work of the triune God applied to social progress. Laboratory proofs of the law of progress the entire failure of evolution as a law applying to human progress, and the fact that this divine process is the effective one, are shown by laboratory experiments on a vast scale. The first one is China. There are certain tests of a trustworthy experiment. One is universality. The experiment must include enough cases to make sure that it is not a sporadic instance. One test is repetition. The experiment must cover time enough to show again that it is not an accident. One test is isolation. Other factors must be shut away from the experiment. China meets all three of these tests. One third of the entire human race. 400 million people now. There indeed is universality. An unbroken, full and careful record of her history, civilization and life for 4,000 years. There is repetition. In 4,000 years of unbroken history China evolved or progressed not at all, in government, in politics, in business, in science, in art, in literature, in morals, in religion. China has progressed more under the influence of the new, divine method of Christianity in three generations, a hundred times more, than she had in 4,000 years. When you were a boy or girl in school you used to prove your examples in arithmetic by reversing the process. You can do that in this case. The reverse proof is Germany. A very large, a very strong, a very self-contained nation. 60 years ago Germany stood on the heights of civilization. A great, God-fearing, home-loving, law-obeying, intellectual nation. The nation of Luther, of Kant, of Bach, Beethoven, and Wagner. But a generation ago a group of leaders, some of them scholars, some of them military men, some of them philosophers, set themselves to eliminate the second person of the Trinity from Germany. They partially succeeded. They largely eliminated him as deity from the Bible, from many churches, from commerce, from education, especially from the universities, from politics, from the army. They eliminated the divine factor and process. And in a generation Germany, with him so eliminated, fell from the heights of civilization to that level in which she now stands. There indeed is the reverse test. Germany's is not the only case, but it is most striking. And Germany's unknown but true leaders today, in their desire to have their beloved Germany recover her soul, her conscience and her vision, and her place in the world, know that the only way to bring it to pass is God's process. German men and women must open their hearts to the lost Son of God. They must become children of the Father. They must get a new spirit, and a new influence upon each other and upon the world. May the triune God grant it. That was Christianity's mighty and divine method with slavery. It did not preach against slavery, in an attempt to begin with results. It changed the nature and the lives of slaves and masters, and made them brothers in Christ, and children of the Father together, and possessed by the same spirit. And Christianity, by that divine process, has destroyed slavery. That was Christianity's method with womanhood. Woman was a slave, a plaything, without a soul, as she is in India and Africa today. Christianity quietly made her the equal in Christ, as a child of the Father, W as a temple of the Spirit, 
the full equal of man. And wherever Christianity went with this divine method, womanhood has come to its own. Civilization faces collapse, many say, perhaps rightly. The only way to stop collapse is the divine law of progress. If someone objects, your try in progress will not operate without God to work it, we answer, we are not trying to find a way to make the universe or human nature operate without God. We are trying to find a process which works. The true workman, the true thinker in action, is the one who will take the method of the universe and apply it to his own work, and, if he needs to begin so, to his own life. He is one who will let the omnipotence of the three in one come into his life and into his work. He is one who consciously lives in the triune kingdom of the triune God. Chapter 11 The Secret of the Universe and the Problem of Ethics, or the Good It should be no surprise to us to find that moral action is based in its structure on that triunity which is the reflection of the being of God. Would that all moral action were based in its character upon the being of God. But in its structure, whether its character is good or bad, all moral action, whether it will or not, is inevitably based in its procedure upon that universal triunity which is the structure and pattern of God's physical and spiritual universe. For in the motive, the act, and the outworking or consequence, of every moral action or decision, will be seen in every way the triunity by which the universe reflects its God. This is especially reasonable. For ethics are based upon the being of God. Ethical standards are not arbitrary. Moral laws are not accidental. Goodness is not based upon some speculative, or over-abstract, or over-practical, or materialistic, or unreal principle. Goodness reflects the goodness of the Creator. Holiness is what every personal being ought to have because God is holy. Conscience is the reflection in the human soul of the holy nature of God. Purity is the clear light of God in a human life, so that the pure in heart can see God. God is more than holy. That he is holy is a characteristic. It describes God. But there are words which define God. They declare his absolute being. God is light, absolute, stainless, shadowless, sinless, ineffable, glorious light. God is love, absolute, unselfish, glowing, radiating, marvelous love. Light and love are more than adjectives, describing his characteristics, they are nouns, defining his very being. And ethics are based on that moral being of God. That is why right is right, and good is good, and wrong is wrong, and evil is evil. God is the reason. It is especially reasonable, then, that all moral action should in its procedure be based on the being of God, which is so reflected in all universal things. Evil acts are of course a distorted reflection, a darkened, hateful, degenerate reflection. But in their structure all moral acts are a reflection. And good deeds are a glorious reflection. For good acts reflect not only his triune being, but his being of light, and of love. What is the structure of moral actions? First, is the motive. That is the source. Without the motive there is no moral action. The motive is the source. It lies deep in the soul. It wells up from unknown depths. It may even emerge from the subconscious. The object of the action may be from without, but the motive which responds to it is from within. The motive is unseen. It is invisible. It is the source of every action. Second, is the act. The motive takes form in the act. It is only as it does so, and becomes an act, that there is moral action. It may be inward, or intellectual, or emotional, or imaginative, but it must take some form, visible or invisible, to make it moral action. The act is the embodiment of the motive, invisible, or tangible, or audible form, or intellectual, or emotional, or imaginative form. Visible or invisible, the act is the embodiment of the motive. The act is the executive factor in moral action. It does whatever is done. The motive does things through the act. Whether visible, or audible, or tangible, or invisible, intellectual, or imaginative, the act embodies the motive, and does what is done, and makes moral action actual. Third, is the consequence, or outworking, of the act. It is the act and its impact on other lives, or other things. Moral actions never take place in a vacuum. If they influence no one else, they influence oneself. No action can be judged, as to its moral character, entirely apart from its consequences. It is not only the act which works out in other lives, in other things, in environment, in oneself, through the consequence. It is the motive also working, through the act, in the consequence. In all these aspects moral action is a vital part of that vast triunity by which the universe is in its pattern and structure the reflection of God. All three of these factors in moral action must be judged together. The act must be weighed by its motive, and by its consequences. 
so it is in any righteous court of judgment. The motive must be judged by its outworking in act and consequences. The consequences must be judged in the light of the act itself, and back of that by its motive. So it always is in honest, understanding comprehensive judgment, by every candid judge or observer. No one of the three, motive, act or consequence, may stand alone. Each pervades the other two. Each permeates the entire moral action. Each has part in making the whole moral action good or bad. Moral action is impossible without all three of these factors. The causal order is always the same. The motive is always the source. The act is always the embodiment. The consequence always flows from the act, and from either motive through the act. It is a fixed, inevitable, invariable order, in absolute reflection of that triunity which rules the universe. Even the man who defies God, who hates God, who denies him, who strikes at him, does these things, in spite of himself, in a triune pattern and structure of activity which reflects him whom he defies, hates, strikes at, or denies. And acts of goodness, of love, of mercy, of unselfishness, of purity, of heroism, of patience, of humility, of sacrifice, how marvelously they reflect God, not only by their structure reflecting his triune being, but by their character reflecting him who is light and is love. And the human life which is made up of such acts as these, is there any other reflection of God so like him, in all this universe as we know it? So does the principle of ethics become truly divine. So it is lifted out of all trivial, or calculating, or self-seeking, or merely human, or mechanical, explanation, and becomes grounded on the center and cause of the universe and of human existence. And so does the good become profoundly, not only in its moral character, but in its very pattern of action, the reflection of God. Chapter 12 The Secret of the Universe and the Problem of Reality, or the True. This triunity underlies the forms of reality. Human reason sees things as percepts, that means as existence is perceived, as things as they simply are, as things in themselves. It sees them also in a second way, as concepts, as general types. Then still further it sees the things as related to other things. It sees, for instance, the individual man. It sees, in addition, humanity in general in him. It sees, finally, the man is related to others. Reason sees, for further instance, the particular tree, simply as a tree, the thing in itself. It sees also the universal idea or type or fact of tree nature. It sees also the tree in its environment, as related to other trees, to other things, and to all the universe. We have clearly three things here. First, the percept, the particular thing which we see. Second, the general nature or type, of which the particular thing seen by us is an embodiment. Third, that particular thing as it is related to other things. Why do things exist in these three ways? Or, if the reason for it is not in the thing seen, but in the mind, why are our minds such that we must see all things in exactly these three ways? Whether they are the forms of reality as they exist in themselves apart from us, or owe only the forms of reality as we see them, why are they as they are? What is the underlying basis of them? And which is the more real, the thing in itself? Or the universal type of which that thing is a particular embodiment? Or the thing is related to other things which it touches and to all other things? This is the third great problem of thought through the centuries, beginning with the most ancient days of Greek philosophy. It is very plain that these three things, the thing in itself, the general type and the thing as related to others, coincide with the three distinctions in the universal triunity in human existence, or in matter, or in time. The person is the particular thing which I see and know. Then on the one hand there is the nature of which the person is the embodiment, an individual nature, but shared with all other human beings as a universal human nature. And on the other hand there is the personality, which is the person as related to others. Or we may, before we go further, put it in the try and order of human existence. First, the universal human nature, of which the individual person is the embodiment. Second, the particular or individual person. Third, the personality, the person is related to others. That is, the universal type or nature, the particular embodiment or thing, the thing is related to others. So also of matter. Energy is the universal, the source, the unseen. The particular motion is the embodiment of that energy. Phenomena are that particular motion in contact with other existences. So it is also of time. The future is the universal source, the potentiality. The present is the particular realization, the embodiment, of the future. It is the thing we know and touch. The past is that present as soon as it has related itself to other things. All of this is very clear. The progress from nature to person, from energy to motion, from future to present, 
from source to embodiment, is a progress from the universal to the particular. The progress from person to personality, from motion to phenomena, from present to past, is a progress from the thing in itself to the thing as related to others. We have then this triunity, one the universal, two the particular thing, three the thing as related to others. Why things are universals and particulars and things as related to others what is the basis of these realities? Why do things exist as universals and particulars and things as related to others? Because they are nature, person and personality. Because they are energy, motion and phenomena. Because they are future, present and past. Because they are triunity. Because they exist in the image of the triune reality and ground of the universe. Which one is real? Which then is reality? The universal? or the particular thing, or the thing is related to others? That is indeed a much debated question. And the conclusion of the debate depends upon the angle from which one looks upon the question. One comes out where one went in. One may be an idealist, and emphasize the universal. One may be a realist, and emphasize the particular thing. One may be a pragmatist, and emphasize the thing is related to others. But in the light of the try and reality of the three, the answer is clear at once. Which is more real? The universal? Or the particular thing? Or the thing is related to others? Each is real, in that try and reality, and each is dependent upon the other two for its reality. The nature is real, but not apart from its embodiment. The embodiment is real, but it cannot exist without its nature which it embodies. The embodiment, the thing in itself, is real, but it cannot be real without coming into contact with other things and becoming the thing as related to others. If the embodiment cannot be real without the thing as related to others, clearly the nature, which cannot be real without its embodiment, cannot be real without the thing as related to others. And manifestly the thing as related to others cannot exist unless it is first the thing in itself, and, back of that, the nature. Each is real. Each requires the other two for its reality. Each is the whole. All are real, in the light of the triune reality, in the image of the supreme triune reality and ground of the universe. The forms of pure reason. Why they are what they are the strict forms of pure reason, the formal expressions of reality, which we call deductive logic, are equally an expression of the same underlying triunity. We have only to examine the syllogism to see that in all its forms it is what it is because of that universal pattern. The major premise is the universal. It is the source. Out of it the syllogism grows. It is the fundamental truth. If it is not fundamental it cannot be a major premise. It is the nature of the thing under discussion. The minor premise is the embodiment in a particular form of the general nature, the universal principle, in the major premise. It sets forth that universal principle in a specific, particular form. The conclusion proceeds from the minor premise. It proceeds from the major premise through the minor premise. It brings both major premise and minor premise, both the universal principle and its particular embodiment, into contact with the things under discussion. It applies the syllogism to life and conduct and environment. The nature or universal, the major premise, the embodiment or particular, the minor premise, the conclusion, or application of the major and minor premises, of the nature and the embodiment, to the things of life and conduct, these are the three invariable factors. The syllogism, the forms of pure reason, are identical with triunity. They are what they are because triunity in the likeness of the three in one is the structure of the universe. Forms of thought versus outer realities we are ready then to answer in the light of triunity the essential question about these things. Are the universal and the particular and the thing, as related to others forms of outward reality which exist apart from our thinking? Or are they simply mental forms under which our minds conceive reality? Are they forms of reality, or forms of thought? Thinking, ancient and modern, sways to and from upon that question. The same question comes in regard to space and time. Are space and time simply mental forms under which we conceive reality? Or are they themselves realities of the outer world? Ancient philosophy held that space and time are outward realities. Modern philosophy, following Kant, tends to see space and time as forms of thought, through which we conceive the outer world. The modern philosophy which desires to transform itself into psychology is very sure of this. It sees space and time as purely products of the mind. They are surely forms of thought. We cannot think of the outer world at all without conceiving things in terms of extension, or space, and of consecutiveness, or time. We can think only in universals, and particulars or things in themselves, and things as related to others. We can reason only in major premises, and minor premises, and conclusions, in some of their myriad forms. They are necessary forms of thought. And they are outward realities. 
for motion, which we all acknowledge to be a universal outward reality if there is any outward reality at all, apparently cannot take place except in actual space. But if that be doubted, we see motion now definitely, in this new world of triunity, as the result of space. We see it as the motion of space, the outspreading of power, emerging through energy into motion. Motion is not a reality unless space, the outspreading of power, is real. And on the other hand motion cannot take place without generating time. And as for universals and particulars and things as related to others, we have seen that they are bound up in one reality. We cannot take out one of the three, and say this one, and this one alone, is real. In their try and relationship and existence, all are real. Space and time, then, and universals, and particulars, and things as related to others, are both mental forms and outer realities. They all exist in the image of the Triune God who is the reality and ground of the inner universe and of the outer universe. Which are more real? The mighty answer which is more real, the inner world with its forms of thought, or the outer world with its motion and substance? That question, great as it is, loses its meaning in the light of the Triune reality. For both the inner world of thought and the outer world of motion and substance are based on the supreme Triune reality. In which then are space and time more truly realities? To which do space and time more truly belong? The question disappears in the light of the fact of triunity. When we see space and time in their most fundamental aspect, as reflections of the Creator, and see the soul also, and all its forms of thought, as the exact reflection of the same Creator, it makes little difference to which space and time most belong. In both the outer world and the inner soul they are the one image of the Triune Creator. What is true of space and time is true of universals and particulars and things as related to others. How largely do these forms of reality exist apart from us, and how largely are they the forms in which the mind works in seeing reality? The answer is truly clear. We can be sure that they are with equal certainty forms of outward reality and forms of thought. For both the world of outward reality and the mind with its forms of thought are made in the reflection of the Triune God. What is the relation between the mental conception and the outer reality? Does the outer world suggest space and time to the mind? Or does the mind project space and time upon the outer world? There is a greater answer. The Triune Creator suggests and projects space and time upon both the outer world and the mind, and together the outer reality and the inner conception form one operation of the Triune God who forever creates both world and mind in his own Triune likeness. In this is the unity of the mind with the outer world. For he made both in his own likeness. In this is the reason that the forms of reality and the forms of thought exactly fit each other. For he made both in his own likeness. This is why the mind can know the universe around it. For he made both in his own likeness. For both together in all these things are one great image of the Triune God. Chapter 13 The Secret of the Universe and the Problem of Aesthetics, or the Beautiful. It is reasonable to ask, does the being of the Creator, which explains so much about his creations, and especially about that wonderful creation, man, explain the creative work of man himself. Certain factors are always found in all creative work of man. Always there is and has been debate about them. Why are they as they are? What is the principle of them all? What is the unity of them all? And there is the further question. Which of these factors is the most vital? It is an endless question, pro and con. The factors themselves are known to everybody. They are found in some degree in every creative work. First the source, the idea, the conception, the ideal, the inspiration. Second the embodiment, the picture, the poem, the sonata, the song, the statue, the building. Third the picture, poem, song, as it affects and moves others. It is always these three factors, whatever the creative work, whether Hamlet or a children's tale, whether the Last Supper or a sporting print, whether Tristan and Isolde or a folk song, whether the seated figures of the Parthenon or a popular statuette, whether the Taj Mahal or a vine-clad hut, always these three. Why are they as they are, always these three, the source or idea, the thing which embodies the idea, the thing working in the souls of others? Because the universe is so. Because matter, and time, and man, and space matter time, and the process of existence, and the principle of progress, and the principle of reality, are so. Because the creator and ground of the universe, of space, matter, time and man, the creator of the creative energies of man, is God the Father, the Almighty Source, and God the Son, the marvelous embodiment, and God the Spirit, who moves in the souls of men. Which of these three factors in man's creative work is the most vital? That is the basis of vast discussion. Whole schools of art have arisen from this or that emphasis upon one factor or the other. Whole schools of theory have hung on this factor or that. Which is the most vital factor? 
Some say the idea. And truly we must have the idea. Without it there is but an exhibition of technique. We all know the things without an idea. The galleries of dead but unburied paintings. The machine made popular songs. The verse which a generation ago was sounding brass and in this generation is tinkling cymbal. The endless streets of dull or smart complacency. We must have the idea, the inspiration. But we must have power to embody the idea. Else it is not art. It is impulsive amateurism. Many fail in that way. We must have technique to embody the inspiration, in well-painted picture, in well-wrought poem, in well-woven sonata, in well-modeled statue, in well-proportioned building. But the picture, the poem, the song, the statue, the building, must touch and influence others. What matter how beautiful it is, if it has no spell for the souls which see or hear it? What use its power, its idea, its technique, if it leaves all other minds cold? We must have the idea, we must have the technique, we must have the instinct for other minds. The picture, the poem, the song, must live in other lives. Which of these is most necessary? Which is most vital? The answer lies deep in the nature of things. In the being of God, the ground of the universe, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are so deeply one that no one of the three can exist without the other two, and no two can exist without the third. The three dimensions of space are so much one that no one of the three can exist without the other two, and no two can exist without the third. Energy, motion and phenomena in matter are so much one that no one of the three can exist without the other two, and no two can exist without the third. Future, present and past, in time, are so much one that no one of the three can exist without the other two, and no two without the third. So also nature, person and personality in human existence are so deeply one that no one of the three can exist without the other two, and no two without the third. And so also it is of human creative work, that no one of the three factors in it can exist without the other two, and no two without the third. It is the unity of life, and all three are vital, for the three are one life. With any of the three lacking, there is no life and no art. The uninspired creation is dead from its birth. The inspiration poorly wrought out is an ambitious failure. The work of art which makes no contact with other minds might better have never been born. But when the three cooperate, there is life and victory. The inspired idea, the source, working through the perfect embodiment, the visible, audible reality, enters into its mighty influence, its living presence, in the souls of others, and the Madonna di San Sisto, the Paradiso, the Misa Solemnis, the Winged Victory, or the Cathedral of Amiens, has fully come into the world. The problem of aesthetics. Where is beauty? And this principle rises also into the realm of universal reality. It leads to the problem of aesthetics, a universal problem, above and beyond all individual works of human creative art. Where is beauty? In what does it reside? That is the problem of aesthetics. Some say that beauty lies in the ideal, the abstract, which the visible or audible object embodies. That is the view of the Platonist. He sees the ideal as existing in all its perfection, bright, ineffable, never wholly to be touched, above and before its appearance in any individual embodiment of it. This is what the idealist holds. Some say that beauty lies wholly or mainly in the object, the work of art or of nature, the statue, the symphony, the tree, the sunset, which we see or hear. That is what the realist says. Beauty seems to him wholly objective. The ideal is to him something which we construct from the definite things of beauty which we see or hear. He is not sure whether the ideal truly exists. Certainly the specific thing of beauty is the most real to him. Some say that beauty is in the mind of the beholder or hearer. Certain things give him pleasure. Certain things give him delight. These he calls beautiful. Beauty then, he is ready to say, and to demand that we should admit, is in the mind of the beholder. It is a purely subjective quality. That is what the romanticist may say. It is what the pragmatist does say. Which is right. Where does beauty reside? In the ideal? Or in the embodiment, the object? Or in the mind of the beholder? Which is right. And what is the reason for it? All are right. Beauty resides in the ideal, the abstract. We can easily test it. We cannot follow the processes of the divine creator of the sunset, the mountain height or the flower. But we can follow our own processes. The artist or the artificer who would create an object of beauty, a picture, a song, a sonnet, a vase, without an ideal glowing before him, a vision of what he would like to embody in his work of art, will fail to capture beauty and fix it there. Beauty dwells in the ideal. And beauty dwells in the object which we see or hear. If it is not there, 
the beholder or hearer will surely never know the ideal which is dimmed and concealed by the unbeautiful work of art. The artist must have his vision, it is true. But he cannot show it to us except in the beauty of the work which embodies it. Beauty dwells in the visible object, the work of art or of nature. And beauty lives in the mind of the beholder or hearer, and would have neither meaning nor reality without its place in the mind of the beholder or hearer. There must be the thrill. There must be the delight. There must be the pleasure. There must be the emotion. If there is nothing of these in any mind as it sees or hears the work of art, where for us is the beauty? How has it any reality? Beauty dwells in the soul of the beholder or hearer. Beauty dwells in all three, in the ideal, in the individual embodiment, in the mind of the beholder. And no one of the three can be the home of beauty or sublimity without the other two. Why does beauty dwell so in all three, the ideal, the embodiment, the mind of the beholder? Because this universe of beauty takes its character from the creator and ground of the universe, and reflects the beauty and sublimity of his being. He is the ideal, the father, the source, revealed by the visible or audible embodiment. And he is the visible one, the son, embodying the father. And he is the spirit, who moves in the hearts and minds of others. And all three are one, in an infinite, intensive, almighty unity. Goodness, truth and beauty these three ideals or facts mean much to many thinkers today. Here we see them in the forms of ethics, reality, and aesthetics. Each of the three, goodness, truth, and beauty, is a perfect reflection of the divine triunity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The formula of the universe the universe of matter, and of time, and of man, and of man's creative work, and of sublimity and beauty, and of space matter and time, and of the processes of existence, and of change and changelessness, and of reality, is one universe, truly a universe, with one pattern, one organic law, built in the likeness of its creator, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three in one. And if to say that the universe reflects its creator seems to any highly sophisticated mind too simple or too romantic, and something more abstract seems desirable, put it in this way, that this which we have been discovering in one realm after another is clearly the formula of the universe, and that this formula naturally and inevitably coincides with the principle of the being of God, who is the ground of the universe. Conclusion The secret of the universe and the riddles of the universe. The Trinity, imaged in the universal law of triunity, explains the deep things of the universe. It shows why space is what it is. It shows why matter is what it is. It shows why time is what it is. It explains why human existence is exactly what it is. The Trinity, imaged in the universal triunity, is the basis of unity in all things. It shows that unity lies, not in a common substance, which is impossible, but in a common structure and pattern. It underlies the relations of space, matter and time. It shows space as potential motion, motion as embodied space, time as successive motion. It shows what is the vast and true relativity among them. It shows the infinite circuit of the universe, out from the mind and power of God, through space, motion and time, back into the mind and eternity of God. It shows the process of existence, the same in all things, and shows that there is no conflict between being and becoming, because being is, within itself, becoming. It shows the law of progress and of change and fixity in the universe, and the method of human progress. It shows the procedure and pattern of moral action, and the basis of the good. It shows the forms of reality, or the true, and why they are what they are, and why the process of reason is what it is. It shows the nature and reason of the beautiful. Wherever there is a universal thing, there, apparently, is triunity, and always with the same relations and characteristics. Triunity in the likeness of the three in one is the structure, the pattern, the unity, the process, the progress, the reality, of the entire universe. The triune being of God is the mighty solution of the riddles of the universe. This is only as it should be. The being of God ought to be the basis of the basic things of the universe. It ought to explain the problems of the universe. It ought to make clear many things which the mind by itself cannot settle. But until that being of God is seen in its full nature, as Jesus and the Bible reveal it, as triune, the vision of it does not explain, it is never explained, these universal problems and mysteries. What we have done is an obvious thing. We have realized that when the being of God is recognized in its marvelous triunity it explains all of these universal things at once and self-evidently. In so recognizing that we have here the solution of supreme problems we need not claim supreme minds. Anyone may gaze on the stars or see the sunrise. The true attitude is humility. What we need is not supreme minds, but a supreme fact. There is no intellectual conceit in realizing that here is the key to the riddles of the universe. 
why should not the being of God be such a key? It is as it should be. The central fact of the universe, the being of the Creator, the three in one, explains the great things and illumines the otherwise difficult mysteries of the universe. Which explains which? The divine triunity explains these universal things. But these things do not explain the triunity. The structure of the universe, the nature of space, of matter, of time, of human life, attest the Trinity. They reflect the Trinity. They demand the Trinity. But while they do all these things, they do not explain the Trinity. The Trinity explains them. Someone will try to turn this whole revelation around, and argue that Father, Son and Holy Spirit are the effort of some long ago thinker to put this universal triunity into theistic form. It will be so argued by someone who does not personally know the triunity of God. The answer to such an effort is, as we have said before, overwhelming. One there is no sign of such an origin in the biblical presentation of the Trinity. Two no man or men could build out of this universal triunity such a matter of fact, and natural, and almost casual, and wholly untheoretical presentation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three there is no reason to think that any man in New Testament days knew or could know this scientific, universal triunity. Four. Above all, such an explanation does not explain this universal triunity itself, in space, in matter, in time, in all three together, in human existence, in human self-realization, in human self-direction, in the laws of reality, in the process of the universe. This universal triunity has a cause, if this is an orderly universe. If this is a theistic universe, that cause must be in God. Such triunity in God is not the result of the universal triunity. It is the cause. For that is what the universe demands as its explanation. It demands such a triunity in God, as the cause of the universal triunity. And that is what the New Testament triunity demands as its explanation. It can have come only from the triunity which the whole universe reveals in God. The universal triunities, therefore, in space, matter and time, and in other universal things, do not cause and do not explain the divine triunity. But the divine triunity alone could cause and alone explains these universal triunities. The reason of the universe is the universe as it is because of some special plan which requires that the universe should be so? Or is the universe as it is from some inherent necessity? These great questions disappear in the light of an answer deeper and greater than either. It is not simply a special arbitrary plan, chosen out of endless possibilities. Nor is it on the other hand simply a necessity in the nature of the universe itself. It lies far deeper. The universe is as it is because it naturally and inevitably reflects the being of its maker and worker. That means indeed a plan of the universe, but not an arbitrary plan. It means a necessity, but a necessity far deeper than anything in the nature of the universe itself. The universe inevitably reflects the being of its maker and worker. He creates it upon lines of his own being. He perpetually creates it and works in it in harmony with his own being. He expresses his own being in it. He shines through its processes. It is the visible vesture conformed to his own mighty being. The divine method of work all these triunities are the workings of an imminent God. He is not merely the creator. He works now in his universe. These things are his method of working. They are not static. They are not fixed and hard. They are his living method of working. The relation between energy, motion and phenomena, or between future, present and past, or between space, matter and time, or between nature, person and personality, is an active relation. It is not merely an architectural relation between the three in each of these triunities. It is an active relation. These things are not buildings. They are processes. It is a working relation. It is the imminent God, working through these methods. He works from energy through motion and phenomena. He works from future through present and past. He works from space through motion or matter and time. He works from nature through person and personality. They are his constant and active method. He works through these triunities in his universe. They are not merely a passive reflection of him in a fixed and universal mirror. Your mirror reflects you. But far better and more truly your ways of work reflect you. These triunities reflect God not only as the passive mirror of creation reflecting the Creator. They reflect him as your ways of work reflect you. They are the triune methods of the triune God working in his universe. As Creator he is reflected in them. As the worker in his universe he shines through them. The deeper mysteries in the universe so all explaining is the light of the divine triunity of God in his universe, that even the deeper mysteries of that triunity cast a revealing light upon the mysteries of the universe. What holds the universe together, so that it works as one immeasurable whole?
What holds the stars in their order and harmony? What keeps them in their orbits? What holds the atoms in order? What holds the electrons in their orbits around the proton in the infinitesimal solar system which we call the atom? The only answer which has ever been given at all is the answer of the Bible, that in him, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, the Creator, all things hold together, or consist. What holds the mind together, in the yet more wonderful inner universe? What holds intelligence, and feeling, and willing, and memory, and imagination, together in order and harmony in the mind? The only answer which has ever been given, or ever attempted, is the answer of the New Testament, that in him, the Son, all things hold together. It means that the Creator, the Son, holds atoms, stars, forces of nature, forces of the mind, things visible and things invisible, the whole vast universe, together in order and harmony, in life and unity. If this mighty answer is true, and certain it is that no other answer has ever been given, then the universe centers in the Son. The same New Testament which brings to us that divine triunity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit which the universe requires depicts also the universe as centering in the second person of that triunity. But if the universe centers in the second person of the Trinity, should not the reflection of the divine triunity in the universe be primarily a reflection of the Son? Would not that be strange? Yes, but so it is. The image in each of those great triunities which make up the universe is above all an image of the Son. The emphasis is upon Him in all of these universal reflections of triunity. Nature and personality center in the person. They are both invisible. It is the person which we see and know. Future and past center in the present. It is the present which alone we can touch and know. Energy and phenomena center in motion. Space, matter or motion and time center in matter or motion. Space and time we know only through motion or matter. The second factor is the most vivid in each triunity. The second factor is not greater than the other two, but it is the most vivid, and so the first and third elements center in it. It is motion, in energy, motion and phenomena, it is the present, in future, present and past, it is matter or motion, in space, motion and time, it is person, in nature, person and personality, which is central and most vivid. And now we see the reason. It is not because the Son is greater than the Father or the Spirit. It is because the universe in its vast triunity reflects most vividly the second person in the three in one, the Son, the Creator, in whom all things consist. A yet deeper mystery the Bible declares in regard to the divine triunity. And yet it fits the facts of the universe and casts light upon these mysteries of the universe which we know only too well. The Bible declares, in a mysterious passage, that at the end the Son shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. This is to be when He, the Son, shall have abolished all rule and all authority and power. It alludes to the power of every evil authority or force, and to the power of death. For He, the Son, must reign till He hath put all His enemies under His feet. The last enemy that shall be abolished is death. This evidently means all that force of death and destruction, both in human life and in the universe at large, which negatives God's whole creative purpose and work. And when all things have been subjected unto him, the Son, then shall the Son also himself be subjected to him that did subject all things unto him, that God may be all in all. A profound mystery, but a profound illumination. We see it going on now. Sin, disorder and destruction permeate the universe now. The Son, the Creator, himself enters the life of the universe in a peculiar and personal way. He does it by entering, as a person, the life of the human race. He becomes man. He overcomes sin. He does this in his own life for 33 years. He does it for mankind, the Bible declares, by his personal death and resurrection. Then he works it out, in man and in the universe. He works in men, the key to the whole vast situation, by his spirit. At last, at the end, he brings all things into subjection. A new created race emerges, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. A new universe, no longer groaning and travailing in pain new heavens and a new earth. All things new. Sin and evil and destruction cast out from it all. Then at last all things are in harmony with God. The nature of God at last holds absolute sway in the universe. The redeeming, reorganizing, recreating work of the Son is done. No longer must one of the three in one make it his work to reclaim the universe from sin and disaster. God, the three in one, the one in three, is at last all in all in his universe. But now, as we can see everywhere in the universe, as we have been seeing in one realm of the universe after another, it is the Son in the divine triunity who is above all reflected. It is He who is re-elected in the vast interwoven fabric of motion. It is He who is mirrored in the living present. 
it is he who is imaged in persons. And it is through Jesus, the Son, that we came to know that whole divine triunity of which he is the second person. He was our point of contact with the three in one. It was his claims, backed up by his character and personality, that brought the divine triunity to us. To know Jesus is to know the triune God. Anyone who knows the triune God will agree to that. And to know Jesus is to know the secret of the triune universe. He is the key to the great mysteries and realities of God, and the great mysteries of the universe, of space, of matter, of time, of the relations of space, matter and time, of human existence, of the process of all existence, of the law of all progress, of the forms of reason, of being and becoming, of the unity of all things, and of countless mysteries yet to be revealed. He is the key, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. The riddle of the universe and its almighty answer the riddle of the universe brings its own universal answer. The riddle leads to reality. Why are all things what they are? Becomes why are space, and matter, and time, and space matter and time, and human existence, and progress, and moral action, and reality, and beauty, all triune, in exactly the same sort of way? And by its universal corroboration and its universal demand the riddle leads directly to its own answer in the triune God. That is as it should be. What else but the being of God could explain his universe? He is the cause of all its triune structure. He is the worker in all its triune methods. He is the solution of all its triune mysteries. Who knows what wonders we may yet discover, beyond all the wonders of modern science, in the natural world and the inner world, when we have learned to see and interpret the universe in the light of its triune God. How many decisive formulae, to unlock new resources of power, lie undiscovered in the triune formula of the universe. How many far-reaching principles may radiate from the triune principle of the universe. How many processes, of value to men, may reasonably be produced from the process of the universe. And surely the more we penetrate into the secrets of personal being, in our intense modern study of human life, the more we must see as their secret the triune being who upholds the universe and in whose likeness and reflection man is what he is. We may escape the danger, which now threatens us, that our immeasurably growing knowledge of the physical universe may overwhelm us, if only we will learn to see the natural world in the light of its triune God. We may escape, too, the greater danger of the present day, in our overeager study of our own being, our actions and reactions, our behavior, our thinking, our reason, and everything else about us, that we shall analyze ourselves into conceit, inbreeding and ineffectiveness, and the deification of man, if only we will see human existence always in the light of its triune God. Is it too much to say, that all things lie open to the thinker who knows the triune God, and who dares to apply the supreme fact of the universe to the other facts of the universe? And what greater things are open to him who applies it to his own life? There lies indeed the way of vision and power, for life is greater than thought, and to know truly the triune God is life indeed. The End